One of my website respondents sent me her personal account of therapeutic gratitude. Her name is Mary Quinn of Ireland. In answer to my request to reprint her writing, she replied, quote, Yes, and in honour of my little one and for all the times her voice went unheard, you may use my name. Unquote. <coughs> Quote, I went to the beach a couple of days ago in the morning and sat watching the sun coming up. I had an incredible moment of the purest clarity. I was watching birds flying low over the water. The moon was still visible and the sun was rising. I realised I was looking at three planets and there was not another person in sight. It was a moment of breathtaking beauty and the tears slid down my face at how deep it is possible to feel. I have been numb for so long. I wrapped my arms around myself and felt the presence of the little one so strongly it was almost painful but in a healing way, if that makes sense. I realised that all the life experiences I have had to date brought me to that exact moment and gave me the depth to appreciate it at that level. A sense of peace washed through me like a gentle wave and for a few moments I felt a connection to a feeling of everything being part of life. It was breathtakingly beautiful. I felt like I was experiencing this moment with all of my senses and I never knew it was possible to be so much in my body. The gratitude feeling is deep and profound when it occurs. It feels like a moment of connection to life itself on the deepest level and in all life circumstances. And what I deem as problems pale to insignificance in those moments and there is only love in its purest form. It truly feels like a blessing, albeit fleeting, but it gives enough sustenance and hope to continue the journey." Unquote. Whatever the source, spiritual and numinous occurrences sometimes provide the survivor with her first sense of belonging to something bigger and essentially good. Such experiences can lead a survivor to an author or speaker or fellow traveller with similar sensibilities and sometimes a door opens for finding comfort with a fellow human. Eventually, this may even grow into a sense that there are some humans out there who are good and safe enough to engage with. Subheading, Gratitude and Good Enough Parenting <clears throat> When developing children receive, quote, good enough parenting, unquote, they feel that life is a gift, even though it typically comes with difficult, painful experiences. The term good enough parenting derives from the work of renowned adult and child psychologist D.W. Winnicott, who coined the term, quote, good enough mothering, unquote, to describe his observation that children do not need parents to be perfect. He noticed through his long career that children grew up with their self-esteem and capacity for intimacy intact when their parents were reasonably consistent with their love and support. Nowadays, many therapists attach the phrase, quote, good enough, unquote, to concepts like friend, partner, therapist, or person. This is usually done to deconstruct perfectionistic expectations of relationships, expectations that are so unrealistic that they are destructive to essentially worthwhile relationships. When I apply the concept of, quote, good enough, quote, unquote, to people, I generally mean that a person is essentially good-hearted, tries to be fair, and meets his or her commitments on a, in a large portion of the time. <clears throat> I also like to apply, quote, good enough, unquote, to other concepts such as good enough job, a good enough try, a good enough outing, a good enough day or a good enough life. I apply this concept liberally to contradict the black and white all or none thinking of the critic which reflexively judges people and thinks and things as defective unless they are perfect. I'll say that again. I also like to apply good enough to other concepts such as good enough job, a good enough try, a good enough outing, a good enough day or a good enough life. I apply this concept liberally to contra contradict the black and white, all and unthinking of the critic which reflexively judges people and things as defective, unless they are perfect. Good enough parents provide generous amounts of support, protection and company. 
They also guide their children to deal constructively with recurring existential difficulties such as loss, real villains, painful world events, and normal disappointments with friends and family. Most importantly, they model how disappointments with intimates can be repaired. A key way they do this is to easily forgive their children for normal mistakes and shortcomings. Children who receive good enough parenting easily recognise and protect themselves from bullying and exploitive people because they do not have to become accustomed, accustomed to being treated unfairly. <clears throat> Growing up in a safe and loving enough family naturally enhances the child's capacity to notice and enjoy the many gifts that life also brings. He learns that there is good enough in life to significantly outweigh its necessary losses and travails. In the traumatising family, however, there is little or nothing that is good enough and hence little for which to be grateful. The child instead is forced to overdevelop a critic that hyper-focuses on what is dangerously imperfect in her as well as others. This sometimes helps her to hide aspects of herself that might be punished. It may further assist her to avoid people who might be punishing. Unfortunately, years of this habituates the child into only seeing herself, life and others in a negative light. Consequently, when she grows up and becomes free of her truly harmful family, she cannot see that life offers her many new possibilities. Her ability to see the good in herself and certain safe enough in others remains developmentally arrested. The cultivation of gratitude requires a balanced perspective. You can learn to see and appreciate the good in life without giving up your ability to discern what is truly negative and unacceptable in the present. <clears throat> Subheading Somatic Healing Trauma takes its toll on the body in many ways. We need to comprehend the physical damage that CPTSD wreaks on our bodies to motivate us to adopt practices that help us to heal on this level. Most of the, cycle, most of the physiological damage of the extended trauma occurs because we are forced to spend so much time in hyperarousal, stuck in fight, flight, freeze or fawn mode. When we are chronically stressed out, stuck in sympathetic nervous system activation, detrimental somatic changes become ingrained in our bodies. Here are some of the most common examples of body harming reactions to CPTSD stress. Hypervigilance, shallow and incomplete breathing, constant adrenalization, armoring, i.e. chronic muscle tightness, wear and tear from rushing and armoring, Inability to be fully present, relaxed and grounded in our bodies. Sleep problems from being overactivated. Digestive disorders from a tightened digestive tract. Physiolo physiological damage from excessive self-medication with alcohol, food or drugs. Moreover, in cases of physical and sexual abuse, our capacities to be physically comforted by touch are eliminated or compromised. And, in cases of verbal and emotional abuse, our capacities to be comforted by eye and voice contact are underdeveloped or seriously diminished. Subheading, Somatic Self-Help The good news is that some somatic repair happens automatically when we reduce our physiological stress by more efficient flashback management. Particularly potent help comes also from the grieving work of reclaiming the ability to cry self-compassionately and to express anger self-protectively. Both processes can release armoring, promote embodiment, improve sleep, decrease hyperarousal and encourage deeper and more rhythmic breathing. Without further expressly somatic work, however, a full relaxed in inhabitancy of your body may not be achieved. Fortunately, there are other modes of self-help for healing the physiological wounds of CPTSD. The, quote, somatic mindfulness, unquote, and, quote, introspective somatic work, unquote, 
sections of chapter 12 describe techniques that can help you to decrease adrenalization, to relax more deeply and to improve your digestion. Moreover, step 7 of the flashback management steps at the beginning of chapter 8 contains six somatic self-help techniques for relaxing out of the physiological hyperarousal of a flashback. <clears throat> Another especially helpful somatic practice is stretching. Regular systematic stretching of the body's major muscle groups can help you reduce the armoring that occurs when your 4F response is chronically triggered. This results from the fact that the 4F activation tightens and contracts your body in anticipation of the need to fight back, flee, get small to escape notice, or rev up to launch into people-pleasing activity. Learning to stretch was a major ordeal for me because of my extreme body armoring. As noted above, it was a task of self-nurturing that I resented intensely, and it took me a long time to adapt stretching as a regular practice. The fact that I had to weather many toxic shame attacks because I was always the least flexible person in the group did not help matters. Moreover, when various people commented about how good it felt to stretch, I felt both puzzled and further shamed because it was anything but pleasant for me. Thankfully, however, reading the literature about it convinced me about its great importance and persistent practice eventually gave me results that I could not discount. I was rewarded by the resolution of decades old back problems. And although I still rarely enjoy the practice, I am absolutely convinced that it explains why I'm still able to run, swim and play basketball in my mid-60s. Stretching has become for me a true labour of love and self-nurturance. <clears throat> Yoga, massage, meditation and relaxation, relaxation training are formalised disciplines to aid in letting go of unnecessary body tension. Reasonably priced classes in these modalities are usually available in most communities. Finally, freeze types and freeze subtypes also typically benefit from various types of movement therapy and aerobic exercise regimes. Moreover, assertiveness training and anger release work are especially helpful for survivors who have difficulty accessing their assertiveness or instincts of self-protection. Subheading CPTSD and somatic therapy. There are also various somatic therapies that can help our bodies heal. As with my earlier comments about CBD, CBT, I encourage you to be wary of somatic approaches that claim to heal CPTSD without working on the cognitive and emotional levels described above. Some approaches, in fact, blanketly dismiss cognitive work in a way that sidesteps the crucial work of shrinking the inner critic. Some approaches also believe that their techniques eliminate the fundamental necessity of grieving the losses of childhood and understanding how abusive and neglective, neglect, negligent parenting is at the root of our problems. Nonetheless, some somatic therapists can ease the physiological traumas that are locked in our bodies as long as the practitioner is not actively dismissing or impeding the client's cognitive and emotional work. In this vein, it is in my opinion that techniques like EMDR, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, and somatic experiencing are very powerful tools for stress reduction. They are especially helpful in resolving simple PTSD. However, they are not complete CPTSD therapies unless the practitioner is eclectic enough to be incorporating inner critic and grieving the losses of childhood work. Other helpful somatic techniques include Rosen work, Rolfing, Rebirthing and Reikian work. These techniques can also be very helpful in aiding the recovery of the ability to therapeutically emote both tears and anger. <clears throat> For survivors of physical and or sexual abuse, I believe Rosen work is especially helpful I found that Rosenworks' emphasis on soft touch helped heal my CPTSD startle response to physical touch. A startle response is a sudden full body flinching that survivors experience at loud sounds or unanticipated physical contact. 
This is usually a somatic flashback to previous abuses. In my case, the startle response was installed in me by my parents through frequent face slapping. As a lap swimmer in public pools, it has taken me ages to significantly reduce being triggered by the hand and arm movements of people who swim alongside me. I also had to shop around to find a Rosen worker who welcomed my use of the verbal ventilation process. Some practitioners prefer to work in silence, and this limits or eliminates the therapeutic benefits to most survivors. It is also important to emphasize here that somatic therapies can be especially helpful in healing the anxiety reaction to touch and physical closeness that many survivors of physical or sexual abuse experience. Exceptions to this are the survivors that I have met who have experienced remediation of this symptom through the help of an especially kind and safe partner. The subheading, the role of medication. As a psychotherapist, I am not authorized to give pharmaceutical advice, but I have frequently noticed that survivors who need pharmaceutical help seem to benefit most from SSRI and its presence. Taken at the right dosage, SSRIs do not usually blunt your effect in a way that makes grieving impossible. Moreover, if your critic does not budge with extended critic shrinking work, SSRIs can usually reduce its volume and vitriol enough so that you can effectively shrink it. Once it is diminished enough, you can dispense with medication. One caveat here is that unless you do extensive critic shrinking work, the critic will be as strong as ever when the medications wear off. Subheading, self-medication. For those who have been repeated, repeatedly unsuccessful at stopping or reducing the use of non-therapeutic medications and substances, Gabor Mate's work on harm reduction may be helpful. Drug and alcohol recovery is beyond the scope of this book, but if you are stuck on habits of self-medication that are not allowing you to progress in your CPTSD, CPTSD recovery, I encourage you to get help from a substance abuse recovery program or from 12 steps programs like Alcoholics or Narcotics Anonymous. Subheading, working with food issues. Let us explore one last arena of physical healing and that is dietary self-help. I agree with John Bradshaw who says that almost everyone who grows up in a dysfunctional family has an eating disorder. This is a key factor in the digestive tract problems that are common symptom of CPTSD. Changing our eating habits is extremely difficult. A client left this quote on my waiting room bulletin board. Quote, Alcohol and other drug recovery is like dealing with a tiger in a cage. Recovery from eating disorders is like taking that tiger out of the cage three times a day and then taking it for a walk. Unquote. Deconstructing food addictions then is daunting work that needs to be approached gradually and with a sense of compassion. This is because children who are traumatically abandoned naturally turn to food for comfort. Food offers us our first outside source of self-soothing, and when a child is starving for love, he frequently makes food his love object. Over the years, he commonly elevates it to the status of a drug. Moreover, increasing scientific evidence is showing that processed food products combining high levels of sugar, salt and fat are especially addictive. Food addictions being pre -verbally, begin pre-verbally. They are functional and useful at the time and help us to survive the unbearable feelings of the abandonment melange. Unfortunately, we are typically forced to rely on food soothing for so long that this overdependence is extremely difficult to overcome. And I do not recommend that anything, anyone in early recovery make this their primary focus unless they have a life-threatening food issue. I prefer instead to recommend mates, Gabor Mate's harm reduction approach. Additionally, Janine Roth's book Breaking Free from Compulsive Eating also offers a moderate and sensible approach to dietary improvement. While many survivors can be unconscious of their damaging eating habits, I have met various survivors who take it to the opposite extreme. I was once in the ranks of those who obsessively overfocus on dietary self-help hoping and expecting that all their suffering will be resolved if they can just find the perfect diet. Many also chase after newly high-touted supplements in this pursuit. 
some of us also approach exercise in this manner. These are understandable but simplistic versions of the salvation fantasy and are typically pursued at the exclusion of working on more core issues of recovering. Nonetheless, almost everyone has some ideas about how they can eat and exercise more healthily. My recommendation is to try dietary adjustments when you can, on a moderate, doable level. This ends chapter 2.